Today, I want to talk about this article that I found recently on the Cato Institute. It's about health care. It was written by Michael Cannon and Jeffrey Singer just last month, December of 2022. As you can see, it's part of their series on empowering the American worker. And a reason why I want to talk about this is because it talks about an issue that I've been wanting to talk about for a while, and that is the federal tax exclusion on health insurance benefits. Article says the issue federal and state health care policies increase prices and decrease supply and innovation. The health sector serves American workers poorly. Prices are sky high, while the quality of care is often exceptional. In many areas, quality is so low as to be dangerous to patients' health. And this sort of reflects my opinion on the current American health care system. In some ways, the American health care system is the best in the world, particularly when it comes to innovation and quality of care, but that's like calling Dorothy Gale a giant because she happens to be the tallest person in Munchkinland because in a variety of ways, the American healthcare system sucks. But not for the reason that we're often told, especially by the hacks, hucksters, and g -g -g goons that we see on the political left who often like to tell us that when it comes to healthcare, we have unfettered, unregulated capitalism or so i do think that right now when we have this no holds barred wild west hyper capitalism okay you expect me to believe that load of crap when in reality the problems in the american healthcare system are a result of too much government intervention i've talked about this before in previous videos like my video titled how the fda saved Americans from affordable medicine. Oh, uh, you absolutely suck! Also, how the government saved Americans from affordable insulin and my rebuttal to John Oliver's segment on Medicare for All. I guess what I'm trying to say is, although uh, the American healthcare system is still, by some standards, the best in the world, there's still a lot of room for improvement. The cause of these problems is a dense thicket of state and federal laws that deny workers the right to make their own decisions about their health care, including the right to control whether, to what extent, and where to spend their earnings on health care. The tax code is the greatest obstacle to workers controlling their health care decisions. For nearly as long as there has been a federal income tax, and for longer than modern health insurance has existed, the federal tax code has effectively penalized workers unless they surrender a sizable share of their earnings to their employer, enroll in a health insurance plan the employer chooses, purchases, controls, and revokes upon separation, and pay any remaining portion of the insurance premium directly. And I would like to pause here for a minute and address anyone who might be new to my channel or anyone who might think that I'm merely following the marching orders of a free market think tank like the Cato Institute. First of all, I understand. Secondly, for what it's worth, I have seen similar reporting on the tax exclusion in places like the New York Times. This article was written in 2017 by Aaron E. Carroll, who I guess is a doctor who does research for the University of Indiana. This article on the New York Times talks a lot about the federal tax exclusion on health insurance benefits and its uh, undesirable consequences. I also found this piece on NPR from 2020 titled The History of Employer-Based Health Insurance in the U.S., where they talk about this topic. I also found this article from, I think, 1993 on the National Library of Medicine, which also talks a lot about this topic. I also found this piece on the National Review from 2014, written by Tom Miller, which also talks about this topic. And if you go check out the videos that I mentioned earlier, I bring in a lot of receipts from a lot of different sources and institutions to talk about those topics. And you know what? If uh, you want to write me off, 
as merely going along with a free market think tank, you know what? Have fun with that. Just know that you're probably going to end up making things worse. The system's implicit penalties are large. Suppose two jobs offer the same total compensation, but one offers $22,221 in health benefits, the cost of the average employer-sponsored family plan in 2021. And I think this is worth highlighting for a second because remember that a lot of the economic experts, especially on the left, the people like uh, Robert Reich, Whenever they want to analyze income statistics, they like to paint a bleak picture. And uh, as I've talked about before, often when they uh, analyze income statistics, they leave out stuff like employer benefits and government transfers, which in this case, if uh, if the average employer-sponsored family plan is roughly $20,000, I mean, if some workers are making upwards of $20,000 in health insurance benefits, uh, that's a pretty good chunk of change to exclude from their uh, income. Keep this in mind next time uh, the Robert Reiches of the world try to uh, paint a bleak picture by cherry-picking statistics, while the others instead offer $22,221 in cash wages. The federal tax code penalizes a worker who chooses the latter job at a marginal tax rate of 33%. The tax code effectively creates a $7,333 per year penalty if the worker wants to take that $22,221 as cash in order to choose their health plan. To avoid that implicit penalty, most, though not all, workers obtain health insurance through an employer. Since employers finance health benefits by reducing cash wages and other compensation, this feature of the tax code denies workers control of a sizable share of their income. In the above hypothetical, the worker loses control over roughly $22,000 of earnings, as well as her choice of a health plan to the employer. In 2022, workers in the aggregate lost control of nearly $1.3 trillions of dollars in their earnings roughly $944 billion that their employers paid toward employee health benefits, plus another $327 billion that workers paid directly. If the workers declined their employer's health benefits and instead took that $1.3 trillion as cash wages, they would have had to pay a total of $352 billion dollars in implicit penalties. Employer-sponsored health insurance is therefore a compulsory system in which workers must participate on pain of higher taxes or criminal penalties if they fail to pay those higher taxes. I think now is a good time to remind everyone that uh, tax incentives are ultimately a form of economic fascism. Sort of like with the birth control tax, a lot of people like to call it the uh, child tax credit. I call it the birth control tax because if you use birth control in effort to not have kids, then it means that you will effectively pay more in taxes than those who do not use birth control. And I know that some people will respond to this by saying stuff like, but, 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 the child tax credit helps, uh, and helps alleviate poverty. <laughs> and I don't know if these knuckleheads realize that they are sort of telling on themselves when they say stuff like this. The implication being that taxation makes people poorer. In which case, I say, how about instead of uh, keeping taxes high and then offering favors and rewards in the form of tax incentives, tax credits, or tax exclusions, whatever you want to call them, how about instead of all of that malarkey, we just, uh, here's an idea, how about we just uh, lower everyone's taxes? Hmm really makes you think. And this is how tax incentives work. It's basically the government and politicians taking more of your money, siphoning more money from your paycheck, unless 
you do something they think is morally right, or you do something that is a gun for society, like have kids, buy a house, buy health insurance for your employees, or in today's world, buy an electric car, or buy a solar panel, an effort to uh, save the world from climate change. <laughs> So I think that tax incentives, I think they are wrong on principle. I think they are ultimately a form of economic fascism. And as we can see with this piece on the Cato Institute, the incentives have long created some undesirable consequences. As we can see, uh, this uh, article has a lot of uh, fancy interactive graphs and charts. And uh, you guys can all check this stuff out on your own time. I will link to this when I get it up on YouTube. But the article goes on to say this feature of the federal tax code, the tax exclusion for employer sponsored health insurance, has done enormous harm to workers. As economists Feldstein and Friedman wrote in 1977, it can with justice be said that the tax exclusion has been responsible for much of the health care crisis. The exclusion reduces access to quality, affordable health insurance, and medical care in three ways. First, it increases prices for health insurance and medical care. Since the tax code penalizes every dollar workers do not devote to health benefits and encourages workers to demand excessive levels of health insurance coverage, excessive coverage in turn leads to greater medical consumption and higher prices because patients care less about both price and quantity when someone else is paying, which in turn push insurance premiums higher. Finkelstein in 2007 estimated that the growth in health insurance in the latter part of the 20th century, of which the exclusion was a major driver, is responsible for half the growth in per capita health spending over that time. Tillipin found that in 2022 that employers offer overly broad provider networks that leave the average worker $620 worse off per year. By encouraging workers to consume excessive levels of health insurance and medical care, the exclusion creates a dead weight economic loss on the order of 1% of GDP, roughly $230 billion in 2021. Second, the exclusion reduces choice, competition, and innovation in healthcare. And I have seen this somewhat articulated in the article on the National Library of Medicine that I mentioned earlier. The article talks about how insurance products and services like Blue Cross evolved and developed over time, showing that over the years, American workers were increasingly buying buying health insurance and how more and more plans were being offered and adopted even before the tax incentives came about. So it is not inconceivable that we would see more innovation and competition in health insurance without these government favors. And you know what? A consequence might be that Americans choose to do without insurance or they might choose to be underinsured, where they may only choose plans that may cover emergencies or diseases rather than a more comprehensive plan. Although I think underinsured is often used as a smear. Think about insuring something like a smartphone. Device manufacturers and cellular data companies offer different tiers of insurance on the devices that they provide. As you can see, they charge higher prices for greater coverage. Yet we don't hear much about how people who choose cheaper plans are underinsured or whatever. Either way, it might be the case that in a freer market, Americans would choose to either not buy insurance or choose to be underinsured, but at the same time, healthcare prices would probably be much lower if consumers were not relying nearly as much on third party payers. Article on Cato goes on to say employers offer workers fewer health plan options than workers would have on the open market. 80% of covered workers have only one or two health plan types from which to choose. The exclusion also tilts the playing field in favor of particular ways of financing and delivering medical care. 
i.e. fee-for-service payment and fragmented delivery at the expense of other payment arrangements like prepayment and capitation and delivery systems like integrated health systems and coordinated care. The exclusion thus inhibits entry and competition by innovative health plans that reduce premiums and improve quality on dimensions where the health sector is weak. Third, the exclusion has for decades stripped workers of their health insurance coverage after they get sick. The average worker changes jobs a dozen times by age 52. Absent the exclusion, workers could purchase health insurance that remained with them between jobs. Coverage that neither disappears nor charges higher premiums because an enrollee falls ill. As Professor Sherry Glide, an economic advisor to Presidents Clinton and Obama noted, quote, before the passage of Medicare, many Americans over 65 were covered by health insurance policies that were guaranteed renewable for life, unquote, because more than 70 insurance companies offered such guaranteed renewable health insurance. Instead, the exclusion penalizes workers unless they enroll in health insurance that automatically disappears when they change jobs or when the employer drops coverage or when enrollees lose a spouse to divorce or death or when they age off a parent's plan or when they retire or when they become too sick to work. And this is actually a point where I think that many people on the left are right to complain. Employer-sponsored insurance really does give a lot of employers a lot more control and leverage over their workers. And the compulsory aspect of it essentially enriches insurance companies at the expense of workers. Not that I'm opposed to health insurance companies making money or making profits. <laughs> I would just prefer that these companies make money by uh, operating on a free market where they do not benefit from government favors like tax exclusions. Of course, the left goes off the rails when they advocate for a socialized healthcare system as a solution. That's just not smart. Workers in poor health are roughly twice as likely to end up with no insurance if they obtain coverage from a small employer versus purchasing it directly from an insurer. Indeed, Congress created Medicare in 1965 in part because many workers who had insurance coverage before retirement were unable to retain the coverage after retirement because the policy was available to employed persons only. Uh, you absolutely suck! Decade after decade, the tax code has penalized workers who choose secure health insurance and forced them into less secure health insurance. As the employee benefits chapter discusses further, these implicit penalties and the insecure coverage on which they make workers dependent lead to job lock and entrepreneurship lock where workers forego better professional opportunities for fear of losing access to health insurance. The exclusion reduces voluntary job turnover by 20 to 25% per year, which prevents workers from making their preferred labor mobility choice, such as to change jobs, start a business, reduce work hours, or exit the labor force to stay home with children or retire. Workers who have health insurance through their employer are less likely to start or own their own business than workers who have health insurance through a spouse or Medicare. Reducing worker mobility also increases employers' bargaining power, and given the linkage between job-to-job -job transitions and wage growth, may reduce workers' lifetime earnings. And the article goes on to talk about a lot of other issues in the healthcare system, including certificates of need laws, which going back to the article on the National Library of Medicine, they also talk about certificate of need laws and how they uh, constrain supply, starting with the, uh, I think the first certificate of need law in uh, New York during the 1960s. There's also another article that was put out by the Cato Institute from May of 2022 that goes even more in depth on the issue of tax exclusion on health insurance benefits. Anyway, it would be wonderful if lawmakers and politicians started to put some real serious thought into reforming 
the American healthcare system. And I think that phasing out these tax exclusions on health insurance benefits would be a good place to start. You would also have to deregulate insurance by phasing out the Affordable Care Act and do other big things like scale back the role of the FDA, if not abolish or privatize the FDA entirely. You'd also have to phase out Medicare and Medicaid and get rid of the variety of price controls that come with those programs. Programs, there is a lot of work to be done in the area of American health care. And we know that Democrats want to do the opposite of deregulate and free up the economy in health care, insurance, and medicine. You have the more consistent types like Bolshevik Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ro Khanna calling for Medicare for all. Speaking of Ro Khanna, he tweeted out this gem recently saying, if you don't believe corporate greed has deadly consequences, take a look at the decline in American life expectancy. And you can see the chart. He says, we need Medicare for all. As if to say that the recent decline in life expectancy over the last few years is due to a lack of Medicare for all. And as you can see with the chart, I don't know how this explains the uh, increase, the improvement in U.S. life expectancy for roughly 30 to 40 years when we also did not have Medicare for all. Not sure how Ro Khanna explains that logic. Ro Khanna also tweeted out this gem saying four decades of extremist wanton neoliberalism have decimated the working and middle class in America, robbing them of 25% of their wealth, enriching the top investors of multinational corporations. So let me get this straight, Ro Khanna. I'm to believe that uh, working and middle class Americans 40 years ago, 1983, i.e. baby boomers and older, you're, you're expecting me to believe that these same people are 25% poorer today in 2023 because some uh some extremist neoliberals extremist neoliberals uh just waltzed on in and took 25 percent of their wealth and gave it to uh multinational corporations. Let's also not forget that Ro Khanna was hilariously wrong on the whole net neutrality scare. I don't know what people see in this monumental goof. Bill Maher still has Ro Khanna on his show from time to time. Many people on the left think that Ro Khanna is just the bee's knees. I mean, how many times does Ro Khanna have to get shit wrong for people to uh, stop taking him seriously? Anyway, we know where Democrats want to go with health care. My question is, where are the Republicans? Don't forget that Republicans failed at their half-assed repeal of the Affordable Care Act, i.e. Obamacare. What was that? Five years ago, they tried their half-assed repeal. Meanwhile, I cannot remember the last time a Republican even mentioned the Affordable Care Act, much less offer any sort of plan at health care reform. And when looking into this, I found two different op-eds, one on NBC News and one on Politico, talking about how Republicans have given up on trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act. The piece on Politico mentions how Senator Rick Scott authored a new agenda for the GOP, which I guess makes no mention of health care. And you'll occasionally see people on the right rightfully, rightfully freak out about horror stories that are coming out of Canada's healthcare system and the UK's healthcare system. But we need to start asking ourselves, what are Republicans doing to stop or better yet reverse the trend of the US healthcare system evolving into one of the socialist Frankenstein monsters like what we see in Canada or Europe? What are Republicans doing to fix or reform the U.S. healthcare system? Apparently, not a goddamn thing. <laughs>